And welcome back. Welcome back to Open Your Eyes. We're now venturing off into our first segment for the morning. A topic uh, very touchy, as a matter of fact. Uh, we know how it has resonated in the newscast a few times uh, throughout the year. It's actually an update on the recent decision on the use of gill nets. Now, we've got two uh, wonderful folks in to talk to us about it. As a matter of fact, then we've got Dr. Percival Cho, who is the CEO in the Ministry of Fisheries, Forestry and Environment, and the Sustainable Development. And Andrew Rowe, who is a member of the Gillnet Task Force. Guys, good morning. Welcome. It's nice to have you in. Good morning, good morning yeah. and season's greetings. Thank, Thank you. Man. Yeah. So, I feel Christmas on this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, let's jump on into it. Um, it. It has been something that a lot of people have been talking about. It uh, directly involves the livelihoods of fishers across this country, whether negative or positive. And folks would want to know exactly where we are at this particular point with the decision on whether to ban or, or whether to uh, phase out or whether to just say, you know what, just continue on with gillnets. At this point, where are we with this situation? Well, you actually hit the nail on the head right there when you mentioned <coughs> the word livelihoods and, and people's stake. So um, the, the decision really was initially thought, I guess, by stakeholders of either one or zero. It's a binary decision. Mm -hmm. I think people are saying ban or no ban. In reality, what, what the government decided was a, a down the middle approach. And I think that created a little bit of confusion. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here today to kind of clarify. Uh, what, what is the decision? It's to phase out gill nets over a period of time mm -hmm. um, and uh, make sure that while we're phasing out, that the livelihoods of the people who depend on the, on the use of these um, mm -hmm. gear is protected and there's way, ways and means to do that you know mm -hmm. for example um, there's alternative livelihoods programs that can be um, enacted uh, with the support of donors for example um, to basically transition uh, gillnet fishers into some other gear yeah. or some other means of making uh, a living right yeah. um, but that takes time and it's a very uh, careful uh, process mm -hmm. and there's a lot of nuances that one has to consider so it's not a straight cut ban or no ban it's, mm -hmm. it's a down the middle approach first of all but it's mm -hmm. it's a, the, the idea is to ensure that people's livelihoods are, are maintained mm -hmm. at the end right mm -hmm. let's let's talk to to the task force for a bit so after the concerns were raised about mm -hmm. the gill nets uh, there, there was this task force put together with representatives from different agencies. Andrew, you were there as uh, the Fishing Association. Yes. Um, and there were NGOs, environmentalists, and government representatives. Collectively, you were to look at the issue and put forward recommendations. Is this the recommendation of the task force? So the, the task force worked along with the ministry, and it, and it wasn't just NGOs, and it was also the fishermen, yeah. the gillnet fishermen were at the table, as well as other types of fishermen, yeah. because this is, as you, as you pointed out, John, in the beginning, this is a this is something that impacts every person who fishes across the board. Yeah. So everybody was was brought to the table, and I think it was the it was an opportunity for everybody to kind of ventilate their concerns, yeah. to, to to have a discussion and say, um, if we were to do X, then A, B, and C would happen. Yeah. So it was um, it was it really did bring forward all of the issues. The the task force also undertook an exercise to reach out to the public to gather information yeah. so that we could understand you know from the people other than the people just sitting around the table what is it that that this um, does for you is it a positive is it a negative mm -hmm. how does it impact you and a report was compiled at the end of it mm -hmm. and at the end of the day I think a lot of it is there, there it was you know it was difficult to say that this task force would ever come to a concrete decision because you have yeah, the two opposing one. opinions two on oppo one point. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's very hard to say that we would come to come together and say this is exactly what we agreed on. Yeah. I think what the government has decided to do definitely encompasses both of what was being looked for. They're putting in measures that were were offered up by a lot of the fishermen mm -hmm. to put in some controls to make sure that gill nets can be used a little bit less um, in a little bit less of a damaging way mm. as we as we move towards or as we move through this phase out process and on from the other side the intention was from the from the from a portion of the gillnet task force that they do intend or we would like to see this gear being you know phased out eventually mm. yeah. and which is the decision that the government has made so now the opportunity has come for for the the, the NGO community and, and the everyone else to jump in and say hey these a uh, phase out requires funding yeah. alternative economic alternatives 
don't come around by themselves. These guys are fishermen, but if you're going to train them to go from one type of fishing to another, yeah. they need to be taught, they need the resources, they need, the, they new, need new gear. Yeah. You know, this gill net that they have, which may have been worth a thousand dollars now, may not be worth as much anymore. So how do you, how do you, how do you get rid of that gear? How do yeah. you compensate yeah. them for it? Yeah. And how do you get these guys and women into, into some sort of alternative that's going to continue to make them money? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's address some of the criticisms that, that have come forward by the people who've been proposing the ban. Um, firstly, one of the, the areas that has been articulated is the loss of funding that had already been raised to help with alternative li uh, livelihoods. Um, I think the environmental sector that they've clearly identified that being able to help people find a different way of making money if you're going to uh, somehow make their particular method illegal was a necessary course of action. Um, however, going this route, the money is no longer available. Let's start with that. Okay, well, I, I mean, I'm sure Andrew has a lot to say on that yeah. as well yeah. because he represents the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries, yes. who, who also had raised um, significant yes. um, sources of or, or amounts of money mm -hmm. to help with the transition, right? If there would be a ban. That, yeah. was, uh, that was the stipulation yes. there. Yeah, so, yes. I mean, the, the fundraising efforts, I think, were, were, were essentially, there were twofold. There's, there's two organizations that are raising money mm -hmm. specifically to provide for uh, funding for a phase out yeah. in, in whatever way mm -hmm. so there was there's a coalition of sustainable fisheries which is a group of organ various organizations from across the country that have come together yeah. who have this common goal of of trying to um you know remove the the use of gill nets and they instead of acting in isolation they came together and formed an ngo called the coalition of sustain for sustainable fisheries the the membership is the belize game fish association whom i represent mm -hmm. um there's uh, yellow dog conservation society which is uh, a big ngo out of, out of the u.s mm -hmm. um turn f atoll trust there's the belize tourism industry association national sports fishing association um mar alliance mm -hmm. and i hope i got them all but they, they've, we, the coalition has managed to raise one million Belize dollars mm -hmm. yeah. to put towards this transition. Mm. Simultaneously, Oceana Belize has also been raising money. Okay. And I can't speak for them on, on what their, their decisions are, but they have also raised a million dollars and the, the use of that money is intended for a gillnet buyback. Yeah. Now, when we put forward our proposals, our, each individually, yes, both of them, Marlene, had in there that a ban needs to take place. Mm -hmm. So. We understand that the government has clearly ventilated its, its position and where they are, that they intend for a ban to take place, but they're not going to push it. Um, they're not going to set a, a definitive date. Mm -hmm. They're not going to push it through until they see that there's been successful transition of these fishermen. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I think both organizations are speaking to the funding agencies that yeah. Well, because you can't disperse money that you've solicited under different terms. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So now that we, I think we, we we seem to understand where the the terms that there that are being put forward we're now trying to negotiate to see where how we can make this thing work and mm -hmm. so far it's it seems to be something that we're going to be able to yeah. to get done i think one of the um, i think one of the concerns one of the concerns of uh, some of those folks would be the duration in terms of phasing out uh, so we've got our government who are saying you know what we are down for a phase out uh, but we've got uh, this could be the political side of things because we also have our opposition who would tell you that you know what why aren't we working along with the fishers why are the fishers not you know if we know what gilnet can do we know and what if because we know next year is an election year what if there is a turnaround and uh, another party comes in and say okay this is the way we're going then where do we go I think this this is part a part of the conversation that must be had because what it does it, it, it could create some confusion. How sturdy are we in terms of the uh, in terms of the phase out? I think that's a very important aspect of thing yeah. to look at. Well, well, it's important to mention that the the decision of the government is to phase out gillnets mm -hmm. if certain parameters are met, right? And one of the main parameters, like I mentioned, is the social well-being of the people who depend on this on this gear, mm -hmm. um, and if you know, some some indicators and i could mention a couple of them for example um that there is a successful transition as demonstrated by mm -hmm. uh, individuals licensed gill mm -hmm. who have pledged to give up this gear yeah. in exchange for obviously the, the the support to transition to something else right 
um, one. And then two, when the number of um, recurrent licensees, get people who come back and ask for a gear license, mm -hmm. Uh, reduces below a certain threshold. Uh, those are good indicators that, listen, this gear isn't being used, utilized anymore. Yeah. Folks have transitioned to something else. Yeah. Now is a good time to, to, to ban the, the gill net, right? Um, so those parameters, and, and there are many others, um, that, that need to be met. Those things are, you, know, you would have to invest a lot of time and effort into yeah. achieving those. Yeah. So, so in terms of a time frame, yeah. we think that that is possible initially and within a two-year period, mm -hmm. but it depends how much effort is put into it and the willingness of the people who depend on the mm -hmm. gillnet to yeah. transition over, right? You see, I think that's, that's one of the, the, the concerns, I would imagine, in, in having this conversation multiple times with both sides. Um, what is evident is that the number of people who are using the gillnets is small in comparison to the number of fishers. So you have the larger majority uh, it's up, what, 2,000, 3,000 um, yeah, uh, licensed fishermen mm -hmm. um, and less than 100 gillnet users. So you have the majority saying, I'm concerned that these practices, traditional be it, by these fishermen, less than 100, are going to cut into my livelihood. 2,400 versus 100. Um, and we know it because we, we've seen the science, we've seen you know, what gets trapped in a gill net, they've provided a lot of images. Mm -hmm. So you have a smaller group of people and you're saying that you want to be able to ensure that they are able to maintain their livelihood. But it's almost like a low hanging fruit that you have there when you're working with such a small population. And not putting in place a definitive timeline sounds a bit like kicking the can down the road rather than striking a real compromise. Well, one can't discount the value of people's livelihoods, even if it's Not five even or ten. one, I Correct? agree. Okay. Yeah. So initially, one has to consider that. Uh, and in terms of a time frame, like I mentioned, I mean, we believe that this is possible within a couple of years. The cabinet was advised of that, and they agreed to, to that um, time frame. Yeah. Um, and what the main thing is the parameters. It's not as if they, at the end of a two-year period, a ban will be instituted, right? There are certain mm -hmm. parameters that have to be met. I mentioned a couple of yeah. them. Um, so in terms of now, so the you're willingness... you're going to issue new licenses for gillnets because you said the relicensing period? Yes, because there isn't... A, there, no, uh, well, let me clarify. No new uh, entrants. So okay. it's a restricted amount of uh, gillnet licenses. So the licenses 80 something now. are the right. only ones allowed to use Correct. gillnets. Right. And if we begin to talk about, say, maybe categorize uh, the current licensees into different brackets, right? Mm -hmm. Um, some analysis has been done, both by the coalition and, and by us. Mm -hmm. And we have some figures in terms of proportions of individuals who we believe, the coalition believes, based on speaking to them, are very much willing to, to give up the gear If they can quickly. find another Correct. means of livelihood. Right? And then you can categorize others who are more dependent on this as the yeah. only sort mm -hmm. of gear that they use to fish. Mm -hmm. They've known it all their lives. It's mm -hmm. the only thing they do. Um, and those are obviously, you need, you need more careful attention to that, yeah. to that process to transition those individuals out, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you have to look at it. There's a lot of nuances. It's yeah. not as easy as a ban or no ban, right? Yeah. And I'm sure that the coalition, yeah. we had a nice yeah. meeting yesterday. They appreciate yeah. the No, the, and I, the I hear what you're saying in terms of, and, and, you know, Andrew clearly articulated it. There were mm. two different sides to this issue. Right. And one being a smaller voice, I, I have to admit that much. Um, but, but what I'm hearing is, is that the compromise is not going far enough. In other words, a, you're appeasing both sides, but with no definitive decision. Um, without putting a timeline for the ban, no one's under pressure to start to look for other alternatives. I think from, I think from at least from the, the coalition and the funders point of view, one of the things that we have, we have accepted is, is very helpful. Yeah. You know, the ban, not having a definitive date is challenging and it's something that we have to work around. But the, the, ones, the other side is that we have been engaged with these, these gill netters from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, not every single one, but the majority we have yeah. been engaged with. And, you know, when the, when the decision came out that there's going to be no definitive date, a lot of them call in and said, hey, listen, I'm giving up my nets regardless of what anybody says. Yeah. And I want the support from you guys to help me do this because we don't see the future in this. We need to do something else because this is failing us. And either we're going to stop using it today mm -hmm. and access funding to do something else, or we're gonna be forced to stop using it down the road 
and it will be at, a free, at free. And we'll have to find out of our own pocket how to transition to something else. So a lot of these fishermen are saying, we want to do this. Now, yeah. if we can work around the parameters that the, the government has put in place, and we can start to distribute this funding, a lot of them, as Percival said, are going to be early uptakers <coughs> excuse me, yeah. of, these, of these options. And we're hoping that we know that we have at least you know, close to half of them are ready to go you know, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're hoping that when they start, the rest of them see, okay, you know, this, is, this is happening, this is real. A ban is on the timeline. It's maybe it's not going to be at the end of 2020, yeah. but there is, that is going to happen. And should I continue investing in my nets? Should I continue yeah. you know, buying more nets? Should I, instead of, of, of doing all of these and taking on this expense, why not you know, offset the expenses, get some money out of this thing, figure out how to, some of the options we have are to become a tour guide, yeah. mm -hmm. figure out how to access deep slope fishing, which is a much, it's a, a very new type of fishery for Belize, which has become very lucrative for a lot of the commercial fishermen, or access scholarships for my children. So offset the expenses that I have now by saying, you know, my kids, my kids' education will be yeah. taken yeah. care of yeah. so that I don't have to continue to gill net fish. Yeah. Most of the, the majority of gill, in fact, every gill netter only does gill net fishing for very, very it's seasonal. small, it's yes. seasonal, it's yeah. a small yeah. portion yeah. of the yeah. year. And so they tell then it, they do something else <laughs> they do during something the else. So the these time. guys are, they're fishermen, at yeah. heart they're fishermen. Yeah. So to take, a, and, and you know, we say alternative livelihoods, we're not, we're not saying we're going to change you to become a farmer or a welder yeah. or anything like that. We're taking a fisherman and just teaching him a new way of doing new fishing. Way, yeah. It yeah. may be fly fishing, for example. Yeah. And yeah. so there's a lot of options on the table and we're hoping that by working within what, what the government has set, mm. the parameters they've set, yeah. we can start this process, get it moving. We're hoping that you know, the people, the gillnet fishers will encourage one another to get into it. Yeah. I'm sure at the end of the day, we'll end up with a, a handful who are just saying, you know what, no, it's, this, is, this is the of way course. I do it. Mm -hmm. And then it will be up to, up to the government to decide how they, how, they, how they handle it and what is a reasonable threshold, yeah. Yeah. having yeah. considered that the majority have been transitioned. Ch you know, environment. <coughs> yeah, change is hard, Ch yeah. but environmental yeah. decisions are tough. Of course. <laughs> and and you are aware of that. And as as science and technology and everything uh, adds to what we know and understand about impacts, um, you know, people are becoming more aware. It doesn't mean that we all move progressively in the same direction at the same pace. Yeah. You know, when the ban on single-use plastic was implemented, there was pushback, but there was a definitive timeline. And it showed that when you have to make that decision, when you have to make that choice between what I'm going to use, where I'm going to source my materials from, I'm going to make it. And, and so that, that is the question. You know, there was a, uh, the timeline put out for the single-use plastics. Yeah. There's a lot of education that has gone along with that. We're approaching the date soon. You were looking at importation. So in other words, there are steps that take place in a band that we're not seeing replicated in this, where we know the Department of Environment has the experience in putting all these things in place. So that's where I think there's still some unanswered questions. And I think what you've <laughs> mentioned, Andrew, really points to the fact that if you already have buy-in from a percentage of the 80-something fishers, then you, you, you're already making some progress course, yeah. if you wanted to move towards a timeline. Yeah. But, uh, you know, is, is there a decision as to when you're going mm. to tie this well, down? Well, that's a good comparison. Uh, let me try and uh, tease out some of the, what, okay. I, what I mentioned again, nuances yeah. here. So with, with, with a plastics phase out, um, the approach was to set a date mm -hmm. and then begin the process, yeah. right? And then use that date. Um, we are over that date a little bit, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but getting there. You know, there's legislation needs to be drafted, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. take time. That gave us, well, me especially, a clear lesson. Yeah. You know, different timelines are very difficult to meet unless you have a, a whole entire machinery in place to get yeah. us there, right? Yeah. So now we're not talking livelihoods in the case of single-use plastics. In the case of gill nets, we are. So it, it makes it a little bit more complicated and mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, uh, precaution required in, in achieving something like a gill net phase out, right? So just to be clear though, the, the decision as the press release had stated last week is to control and eventually phase out gill nets. Yeah. That's the decision. Mm. Right? There's a process to get there. <coughs> um, so the, 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 the word or the phrase alternative livelihoods uh, really conjures up something that we call social safeguards. Right? Okay. Mm. So any environmental action that we take, any protection 
Um, anything, for example, building a road, it's not environmental action, but it's, it's a development, right? Mm -hmm. There's safeguards that one has to put in place. If you're fixing the Western Highway, for example, you might have to move people, yeah. right? So you have to consider the safeguards that you have to put in place to afford those people some other place to stay, Alternative some other mm -hmm. piece of land, right? Mm -hmm. So any action these days, we have to consider the safeguards, both environmental and then social. So this action of phasing out gillnets, obviously you have to consider social safeguards. So that process itself makes it a little bit more, like I said, complex, yeah. right? Requires precaution. Yeah. yeah. But y you know, like, like we mentioned, the situation of change is def very difficult, especially if it is something that you've been uh, totally used to over yeah. years, mm -hmm. because these guys came from years and years. It's and let tradition. me say generation, it, it is tradition. But the idea of a phase out when it comes to fishing or using uh, gill nets, because using a gill net, you simply, does, you simply scoop up traditional fishing. You're going out there, you've got the patience, you need to these guys would ne would uh, probably need them need to move from here to now. Where did the idea of a uh, phase out come from? And have we have we have we shown these the these folks uh, the a, a proper example of what a phase out can do for them? Now I'm asking this because we've got countries like Jamaica, who you know I, I'm not sure if they've got their if, if they've banned any gill net or how their fishing how their fishing situation is. But where did that idea come from? And in terms of the buy-in, that has to be the, 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 the part that we strike gold, uh, gold okay. at. Mm -hmm. Do they have information that they can read up for themselves yeah. so they can see, you know what? Yes, it is one of the best things for us to do in terms of a phase out. Where did that idea come from? Sure, well, well I think, I mean, it's, it's in discussion at the task force level. We realize this isn't a clear-cut approach, yeah. right? It's not it's a not. one or zero. It's yes, not, yeah. it's not. Right? So, one has to take a phased approach, and we use the term phase out in, in, in that regard, right? Um, and I, I'm not familiar with, with Jamaica and their gillnet um, uh, situation, situation there, yeah. right? But in, in the case of us, I mean, it's, it's clear, looking at the environmental effects of, of fishing as a whole, yeah. um, both deep slope, both traditional hand line, and then net fishing, mm -hmm. there are impacts to everything. Mm -hmm. But I think it's well understood that gill nets, because of how they operate, because you set this net and you leave it for a long time. Yes. Yeah, it could be a couple hours, could be overnight, I don't know. Up to multiple up, days. Up to multiple yeah. days. Um, it's not uh, uh, like a hand line. It's not you, you know, you're there, you're monitoring what you're doing. Right? So gill nets obviously are, you know, can have very detrimental impacts. Mm -hmm. And I think that really sparked this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, is. right? Um, and, and I think you know, they, they, we settle on a phase out approach as, as a government, and that set the tone for our partners, the NGOs, the fundraisers, everybody to understand clearly what the decision is, and then to work within that, that yeah. context, right? And I think too that the, you know, the, the folks who are representing the gillnet fishers, at least in the public and in the media, yeah. are representing really the minority of yeah. the gillnetters who are the hardcore holding back. Yeah. There's a lot of gillnetters who, like I said, they, they want this to happen they re they there's there's even on on the in the coalition we have um we have former gill netters who years ago transitioned to yeah. other yeah other one means. one was on, on yeah, the set, yeah. And, and they're shining examples of you know they said this is not working this is not the future for mm -hmm. for anybody mm -hmm. yeah. and so we on our own accord will go out and figure out how to get this how to change yeah. now they were fortunate that they may have had the resources the education and whatever to do this and I think that by, you know, by leaving this gear in place is really disparaging these fishermen. It's saying, you know what, yeah. you're not, you're not smart enough. You're not, you're not good enough to yeah. do something better for yourself. Yeah. So that's why we have come along. We said we need to. These people need to be moved out of this because there's no future in this for them. Yeah. They need to be given an, a better option so that we can all benefit from it. Yeah. And yeah. what about enforcement? I mean. Let's, let, let's be clear with the facts here. Gill nets are already very regulated. There's a specific size of mesh. There's a specific distance that it has to be um, from the coast. There are particular areas you can't use gill nets. Just in our newscast, I think we've probably documented quite a few times, well, right here in the Belize City Harbor, there's, uh, there are gill nets that have been found. We found fishermen who come in and make reports that they find gill nets yeah. and they destroy them or take them out. We know that to it 
have proper enforcement in our seas is a challenge. You're talking about human resources, financial resources for fuel. Mm -hmm. How are we going to manage it in the interim? All right. Well, the, the, um, the issue of finances for enforcement um, is, a, is, is an issue for both uh, a, a ban scenario mm -hmm. and a no ban scenario, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think it's more um, of a, of a if, if it's a, it's a greater <coughs> quantum on the ban scenario side because yeah. you know you're talking about enforcing um, the, the the laws, the gillnet laws, and okay. fishing laws across yeah. entire waters to look specifically for one particular gear which is no longer um, well in, in in a future time no longer usable, mm -hmm. right? Now, we estimated, just running some figures, that um, an enforcement budget of at least one million Belize dollars would be what is necessary to um, put in a level of enforcement that would, of course, um, achieve some, be a deterrent mm -hmm. and, and achieve some level of success there. Um, with regards to the illegal use of gill nets, I think we have to categorize it into two, two areas, right? Yeah. There's people who are licensed or might have a license for a gillnet, but using it wrongly. Mm -hmm. And there's those who, there are those folks who don't have any licenses and then use the gillnet irrespective, right? Mm -hmm. um, we think that enforcement is a, a major concern. It has been discussed at the task force level. Um, I know the fisheries department right now, they're submitting their budget. Uh, they have a nice um, description, a nice request for new spending in there in relation to enforcing uh, the fisheries laws in respect to, to any, 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 any aspect of it, gillnets, handline, protected areas, etc. Right? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at boosting that level of investment there. Of course, we have other partners as well, other donor agencies. We have all the, the various co-managers who work with us in, in enforcement. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the Coast Guard, who are very much there by our side uh, in the waters, enforcing the laws alongside us. Yeah. Um, part of the decision, as you know, is to institute a immediate ban on use of gillnets um, below Punta Gorda, south of Punta Gorda. So we've been in consultation with the Coast Guard mm -hmm. okay. as to what lateral uh, latitude to mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. um, to institute that ban. Um, so various enforcement partners are there at the table. We need to, I think, bring together everyone again and, yeah. and discuss how uh, we can put together a nice strategy mm -hmm. in relation to enforcing um, the fisheries regulations throughout the waters, inclusive of, of gillnet regulations. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hear your, your example that you're giving, um, but I, I don't think that it's, it's particularly accurate. I think if you imagine that grenades are not allowed in the country and the police see one grenade, they can confiscate it or remove it from wherever it is versus having to go and check if it's licensed and who owns it and if that person has a license and if it's in an area that it should be. So I, I don't think um that that seems too accurate the question I, I i still haven't heard answered is simple there's a compromise being made and i think that is a great move when you have two different opinions the best thing to do is find the best workable compromise mm -hmm. but what i don't hear are definitive actions that will be done during this time any transition has a learning curve, mm -hmm. but there has to be something that will show that you're making progress. And so saying a few things I've heard from you. One, so there's a band below uh, the, in the southern waters. Mm -hmm. uh, fishermen who are licensed will be able to continue to use it. No new fishermen can get, get licensed mm -hmm. for gill nets, mm -hmm. but those who are licensed can continue to do so until they are ready to transition and until that number, which we don't know, hits a low enough mark for a ban to be instituted. So there's, there's just a lot of unknown variables here and I'm, I'm just questioning, are we, are we moving towards tying down the details? Because the devil is always in the details sure. with mm -hmm. things like this. Well, those things you mentioned are exactly um, the activities that are going to be carried out during the phase out period. Mm -hmm. There's one um, that we haven't mentioned yet, which is a decision to vary the alter the net size, the legal mesh size mm. um, that is allowable. Mm. Um, there is some research, you mean some like studies done. It bigger, smaller? Yes, larger. Okay. To suggest that a larger mesh size would be uh, more or less, um, less harmful, mm -hmm. yeah. um, afford less bycatch. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're going to move towards something closer to four inches uh, in terms of the mesh size. But then what happened to the size. smaller ones that exist now? Well, those won't be usable anymore. 
So it costs a thousand dollars. That's obsolete, and I spent a thousand dollars to get a four-inch one. So that's part of the that's part of the you know that's part of the whole process. You know that I have a three-inch mesh net today that I've licensed. Now that n that net is unusable mm -hmm. legally. Mm -hmm. Of course, legal is a whole different mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Should I take a thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars out of my pocket, or go borrow money to go buy a new net, or why not take the opportunity to sell this? into the buyback program and start on this economic alternative program. Yeah. Why would I invest this amount of money into something that we can see whether we don't have a date, but we know that this is going to become illegal. <coughs> so why should I go and make this investment to try and earn back a little bit of money when I can go in another direction? I can take this net here that's now worth nothing because mm -hmm. I can't get it licensed. I can still sell it off into this buyback program, get some money, and I can then start, and I can choose one of these alternatives and I can start down that path. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that is, you know, that's one driver that will push these fishermen into deciding that this is a good, this is a better option to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the strategy is clear, like, like Andre outlined, um, but also we understand that several gillnetters, or most of them, have multiple mesh size nets, right? Mm -hmm. So three inch, four inch, etc. And, and this recommendation about the mesh size actually came from the gill, gill net fishers themselves mm -hmm. during the task force discussion. So we think that that is obviously something that, that both sides are in agreement with, that the mesh size obviously, the mesh size for, for continued use of nets has mm -hmm. to change. Mm -hmm. So what happens after this point? The task force continues? Are we going to, what's going to happen now? Sure. So the, the, the added to the points that you mentioned is another decision um, that cabinet um, agreed to, which is the establishment of a committee. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew and I and, and another partner discussed it yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we're going to exchange some communication and try to set up this committee mm -hmm. very quickly mm -hmm. to really oversee, guide the transition process, ensure that the parameters are being met, mm -hmm. and provide that sort of monitoring um, uh, uh, process. Um, uh, as we go along the, the phase out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Well. Sounds like there are still some stuff that there's has to be sorted there's out. There's still here. a lot that yeah. needs to be ironed out. Funding is still, yeah. I, I have to say, yeah. that funding is still not secured because the, fun, the, the premise that we raise the funds on yeah. mm -hmm. is not in place. Mm -hmm. So that is something that has to be, that still has to be ironed out. Mm -hmm. There's, but I think the positive is that that the, the ministry is open to the dialogue. Yeah. Um, the, the, the funders and the people who, who are representing them are open to dialogue. We see that there is, you know, there is some, we, we might be able to line up our, our, um, line up our thinking, mm -hmm. and hopefully if it works, we can, we can begin to move these people out of using gillnets and uh, towards a, a ban that has to take place in order mm. for the funding to be to, to be released. Well, I do hope that we hear some more definitive details in the sooner rather than mm -hmm. later future, mm -hmm. um, because I think that striking a compromise is always a good way to go, but you can't leave everything up in the air, and it really does, based on your answers that you provided, it really does seem that there's still a lot of questions that have to be answered, and we don't want to isolate any family, um, but I, if we're going to go this way, I think we need to decide definitively that we'll go this way. Yeah. Well, like I said, the decision is definitive. There is a, a decision to control and eventually phase out gill nets. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think that is definitive, you know. All right. Okay. Well, we thank you guys so very much. Uh, Dr. Guys. Percival Cho mm -hmm. and uh, Andrew Rowe, thank you so very much for visiting this morning. And i uh, tell you what, as soon as we get to the ban, you guys will be welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That. <laughs> We're only kidding with you. But we'll uh, take a break. And when we come back, we've heard of uh, um, calendars female. Well, I'll tell you what. Calendars with male. That's coming up when we come back. <laughs>